Uh, hello, welcome back. Um, my name is Ian Wallace. Uh, I am the co-director of the Cybersecurity Initiative at New America. Uh, and I want to begin by thanking uh, Rob and the last panel for helping us frame the issue and get a, a, a good sense of the challenges we face. Um, but as I said at the beginning, we're very definitely not simply about admiring the problem. And uh, one of the most important things that uh, uh, we, we want to address today is how we can take some of those insights about the threat environment, uh, combine them with a, a sense that the cybersecurity uh, industry, uh, insurance uh, industry has, has a real potential to, to, to make some impact on, on wider cybersecurity and, and look at what the impediments to that might be and how we move forward. Uh, so, uh, for our second panel, uh, we are going to be in the able hands of uh, John Reed, the Managing Director of Just Security, who has been writing and reporting on the, the cyber, in, cyber industry for, for, for quite some time, and uh, a, a truly uh, uh, exceptional panel uh, of experts. So, without much of ado, I'm going to hand over to John and uh, invite him to introduce the panel and get the discussion underway. John. Thank you so much, Ian, and thank you for everybody who uh, is in attendance here and watching online. Uh, thanks to uh, New America and its Cybersecurity Initiative for uh, hosting this event with us. And also thanks so much to our panelists who, as Ian said, are a fantastic group who bring a wealth of knowledge from uh, the private sector and government. Uh, to my right, we have Tom Feynman, Feynman I'm sorry, Senior uh, Cybersecurity Strategist and Counsel at the Department of Homeland Security. We've then got Harvey Rishikoff, Senior Counsel and, at Crowell & Mooring and a Cybersecurity Fellow at New America. And another Cybersecurity Fellow at New America, Alana Breitman, and she's also a shareholder at Greenberg Traurig, and author of the New America White Paper, Smart Cyber Legislation, What Congress Can Do to Foster America's Cybersecurity. It's available out in the lobby if you've seen it when you uh, walk by. Uh, and Catherine Mulligan, Senior Vice President at Zurich, and then we have Greg Vernacci, Senior Vice President at AIG. And so with that, I'd like to open it up for a brief uh, opening statement from uh, each of our panelists. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Um, <laughs> uh, DHS got interested in cybersecurity insurance about four years ago. Um, we came to the conclusion about that time that regulating our way out of cyber, cyber risk is probably not going to happen, and we were looking for uh, market-based incentives to encourage people to mitigate risk more effectively. Insurance was a logical avenue for us to explore, and we've been doing that ever since. And really, we've been looking to see the, the capacity of the insurance industry to uh, incentivize better cyber risk management, thank you, uh, by uh, rewarding companies that manage their cyber risk well um, with hopefully more coverage at, at affordable premiums. Uh, we've discovered many of the same challenges that were discussed on the first panel, a lack of actuarial data, a lack of common cybersecurity best practices, metrics, and standards, um, some ongoing confusion about critical infrastructure dependencies and interdependencies, and really a failure to in include cyber risk within existing enterprise risk management programs. Um, we, we've been particularly interested in the market's capacity to cover some of those property damages and bodily injury from cyber attack, and that's a new area for, for us and, and certainly the insurance market as well. Most recently, we've been leading a discussion between insurers and uh, chief information security officers this year, talking about the concept of a cyber incident data repository. How do we get that data about incidents that not only insurers can use to hopefully develop new kinds of policies, but also help cybersecurity professionals mitigate that risk more effectively in their work environments. So I'm honored to be here this morning and look forward to the discussion. Oh, do you want me to go next? Okay. Uh, um, so, first of all, let me thank, uh, as I guess the microphone's not on. Okay. Um, well, first let me thank um, the New American Foundation and Just Security for putting on this particular program. It's always nice to be back at NYU Law School, uh, and it's great to have this forum. So I would frame my remarks by saying that when you think about how you want to raise the bar for cybersecurity, you basically have what, we, you, what I call four big hammers. And one of the hammers is, of course, legislation and regulation, uh, which we're seeing increasingly. Uh, coming forward with that, uh, currently we have the article about uh, from Anya about what's happening with cyber legislation. 
And then the other major hammer is um, the tax code. And increasingly, we're seeing people looking at taxes for incentives. Uh, a third major hammer is something close and dear to the law school, which are lawsuits. And we're starting to see class actions being certified for the first time in a variety of the circuits and the trial judges. And the, the fourth big hammer is insurance. Insurance has the ability to raise the level vis-a-vis -vis, um, the quality of defense when the companies come in and decide, decide how to do these questionnaires and how they're going to, before they insure, what they're expecting from the client. And that's across the board. So I think it's important that we're thinking about insurance. And then many of us who are involved in this space, we often e explain to the chief executive office, officers in the C-suite that one of their uh, goals or one of their um, uh, arrows they need is cyber insurance based on what's going to happen for an event. And this, these type of panels are starting to happen all over the country, and I think the insurance companies are beginning to see this is a major issue. And as we said last, in the last panel, the general liability looks like it won't be adequate coverage, and we'll hear from our, our representatives of the insurance company, and that we're particularizing looking at cyber as separate policies, and the industries across the board are trying to figure out, okay, what does that mean? How do they establish the premiums, and how are we going to go forward? So I'm sure we'll get into that in the discussion as we go, as we continue. Thanks. Thanks, Harvey. Um, and thank you also for this panel and the audience um, interest in this, because I do think that cyber insurance is such a terrific opportunity to increase uh, cyber awareness and cyber hygiene among um, companies, especially in the, in the uh, SME sector where uh, cyber, good cyber hygiene hasn't taken as place as much. So I started by looking at, well, what can Congress do? And it was very exciting for me as a veteran of several failed cyber bills in Congress uh, <laughs> to see that something actually was passed in the House that was so similar to the Senate that if the Senate was able to pass its uh, companion bill, we would probably get to a conferenceable bill that the President would sign. Uh, as you all know, it's, it basically ha is a three-legged stool of um, authority for uh, uh, information sharing, liability protection, and um, uh, some other aspects that, that support uh, both of those. And the Senate is uh, due to consider amendments tomorrow. And it's looking more likely than not uh, that it will be able to pass a bill. Um, and then, you know, it looks like we're going to get somewhere. So that is a terrific step. And those, are, those bills are going to be a positive. But when I started to really think about what moves the market, I was worried that they wouldn't be a positive enough. And again, having uh, lived through a, a number of bills that tried to have more teeth in them, I also know that politically it's pretty much impossible right now to pass any legislation that has mandates in it, um, which is another way that you really get uh, changes in cybersecurity practices. So it seemed to me that insurance, with its history of promoting good, safe practices in any kind of field, um, was an important uh, lever for this, and what can Congress do? And, you know, I'd written about a couple of things that it could do, and I'm eager for the discussion because maybe there's more and we could promote even more things. But um, even with the information sharing that has been set, set up thanks to the NIST framework under the presidential executive order, uh, much more data can be shared um, in much more specific ways to understand the nature of the breaches in different sector. Um, what kind of uh, impacts they have, and what are the costs of those impacts. I think and we'll hear more from the insurance colleagues, but it seems to me that that is very helpful information, much more drilled down information to, um, to help what the information is being gathered now. And that's where Congress can help with support, whether it's additional funding, which is always difficult, or reprioritizing funding to um, support more uh, investigation of some of this and hosting it as public in a public database. Um, the other pieces, uh, th there's been some in kind of intriguing work done uh, in the past around the Safety Act and TRIA, both of which were designed to deal with terrorism concerns, uh, but are applicable in cybersecurity, where in the Safety Act, if you get um, a product certified, you actually require insurance up to the cap uh, uh, around that product. The TRIA, where it's basically a secondary insurance market for uh, really major events, uh, 
you could arguably use current law to squeeze in cybersecurity, and certainly there has been some cyber um, certification under the Safety Act. But the problem with cybersecurity, of course, is the attribution problem. And so, especially in TRIA, where you have to attribute to a terrorist group, um, it's very difficult to attribute a cyber event. So I propose that Congress might think about passing a, a special Cyber Safety Act and a special Cyber TRIA that would really um, support uh, the budding insurance industry uh, that's already in place. Oh, sorry, thank you. It's the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act. And basically, after 9-11, uh, when uh, there were just major losses uh, that were very threatening to the entire industry, the government passed basically a secondary insurance bill where if um, the government certifies that something was a terrorist event, there are a couple other factors, then uh, TRIA could kick into place to, uh, to insure the insurance companies. To my knowledge, it's actually not ever been used, uh, but at least it's, out, it's there as a placeholder, uh, as a backstop. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm grateful to be on this august panel. Um, and I, I was really happy this morning to see such a lively crowd of people asking questions about the insurance industry. Greg and I didn't know this in the last 20 years of our career that we'd actually get this kind of interest, so it's terrific. Um, the 2015 World Economic Forum report talked about how this problem is one that will have to be solved with a public-private partnership, and I think that's important. Um, somebody asked me earlier this morning if I live in D.C. because I'm there so often um, talking about this topic. Um, and, and I think that I'm, I'm keen to parse where, where the role of insurance is, what the limitations of that are. And also, I think it's probably helpful to talk a little bit about where the insurance as the product today stands and what the, the future kind of holds. And I think John has that set up in some of our questions. So grateful to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Greg Vernacci. I am responsible for the cyber solution product at AIG for US and Canada. Um, likely very happy, likewise, I'm very happy and honored to be here. Um, but when I was looking at the session description, I was a little bit shocked. It was describing the cyber insurance market as stale. Uh, and, and maybe I'm biased. I represent the cyber insurance carrier side. <laughs> uh, <coughs> but I think it's anything but that. It, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's evolving it's, and it's thriving. And I really think cyber insurance is becoming a, a critical part to an organization's information security risk management program or approach. Um, just to give you a little bit of history, the coverage has been around for about 15 years. When it first started, it was really just about network security liability, then quickly expanded to address privacy liability issues. It went from being a data disclosure policy to addressing wrongful collection. You know, and, and these days, you know, uh, there's a lot of issues, uh, and the coverage is really moving forward around network interruption and addressing dependent business interruption and uh, responding to issues that aren't even arising out of a security failure or a computer attack. Um, you know, I, it, you know, there's some estimates that the, the market's about $2 billion in insurance premium. That's pretty decent in 15 years. Uh, but there's estimates that it's going to be about 7 to $10 billion in, in the relative near future. Uh, at AIG, you know, we have about 20,000 different clients that are purchasing cyber insurance. Uh, and I know they're using the policies. You know, and these clients, they really range from the very large multinational all the way down to the very, very small local florist and dentist office. Uh, like I said, I know they're using the policy. We're receiving three claims every single business day. Uh, so there's activity out there. Thankfully, they're not all multi-million dollar claims and they're not all bodily injury property damage and that's one of the things that we're, we're looking towards in the future. Uh, but there is activity there. You know, the, the, other, the other main point why I think this market is thriving is that, and I, I used it in my title as cyber insurance solution, is that this is really more than just an insurance product. It's really more than just a risk transfer solution. More and more carriers are offering loss prevention and risk consultation with their product. We're trying to help our clients be aware of what the issues are. We're providing them access to experts. We're giving them content. We're giving them some tools and services to hopefully mitigate the exposure before it actually happens or the claim or breach actually happens. So I think it's thriving. Obviously, there are some challenges, which I'm sure we'll get into in this session. Excellent, excellent. We just heard all about risk and defining risk from our last panel, um, but I would like to start off and frame our conversation kind of by, um, by getting this panelist's 
thoughts on what's still needed to meaningfully evaluate the impact of cyber attacks on businesses? How do potential clients think about the risks when they're choosing their insurance? Do they have a, a, are you finding they have a clear idea of the risks? What's needed in this, in the, in this regard? Uh, I'll go first, sure. Um, you know, I think the first thing we're looking for from our clients is to realize this is an enterprise risk issue. It's a business risk issue. Um, it's an issue that can impact the business from, from top down. And I think when we talk to a lot of clients, they don't realize that or they don't approach it in that way. They view it solely as an IT issue. Um, so I think for us, I think clients, that, that's the first step. They're realizing it's a bigger issue. Having a risk assessment framework in place you know, and, and I'm, I'm not going to advocate on one on behalf of the other, though I do think the NIST cybersecurity framework is fantastic. The, the concept of having an organization just realize there is a lot more here and figuring out a way to deal with it in pure risk management I think is, is critical. Um, so I, th I think that's the first thing that we need. The challenge we have, though, in, in addressing that is, is information, getting our information from our clients in a consistent and standard way. Um, whether it's the controls they have in place to deal with an issue, um, you know, Alyssa talked about end-to-end -end encryption. I think that's an important tactic. But what, is, what does that mean when a client has it, and what is that, what's the benefit of it? So I think that's, that's part of uh, what we're looking for. So I guess um, the way we sort of frame it for our clients is that we talk about the boom, and the boom is when the uh, entity understands, discovers that there's been a penetration. And then the question is, once you have that penetration, what is your risk management um, process you have that people come in to help clean up the network? And that in itself is when everyone gets notified, and that's when you go forward with what you think your plan was as to whether or not it's effective and how you've tested it as we're saying, what your risk management committee has put together. Left of boom is before the incident takes place, what have you done to establish your network? How have you tested your network? What have you done in order to demonstrate compliance over the pre-period? And then right of boom is, what do you do for notification issues? What do you do for the public relations of your firm? What are the requirements for what you have to do for notification of SEC or all the regulators, depending on what industry you are? And the insurance issue is in each part of that continuum of those three issues, of those three segments. And I think getting the corporate sector and C-suite to be under, understand, that's how they have to understand the, the magnitude of the problem. And then to figure out, at this point in time, there's no one entity that gives you a solution for all three segments. Uh, the market is quite broken up for very good reasons, because there's a lot of potential conflict of interest depending on how you resolve that given the three different segments. But I think we're looking to see what that means for the insurance industry and then how the insurance industry is putting value on what it means to have the loss and how it characterizes the loss and therefore tying it to what the appropriate premiums are is how I think people are beginning to understand how to think of risk in this particular space. Yeah, linking together what Greg and Harvey have said, that one of the sea changes that we saw in the last 18 to 24 months was a, an increased awareness at the level of the C-suite and the boards of directors um, relative to the scope of the issue and the fact of how they could be impacted. So we're really seeing a, a welcome move of all of these issues, the notification, the regulation, uh, compliance piece and just the preparedness and the responsiveness, it's moving out of IT and that's essential. You know, the Standard & Poor's issued a report a couple of months ago around um, the state of the market and that did say that risk managers are, are talking about the challenges of accurately reporting out all of their exposures and controls. And it, this is not just an IT issue, somebody in the earlier panel asked a question of, well, what kind of, of information do underwriters ask for? We do ask the IT questions, but we also ask the, the people and the culture questions. This is a product that typically resides at, at Zurich or AIG in the management solutions kind of realm of insurance because we're really talking about how the company manages the risk um, from a communication standpoint, so I would emphasize that, that it's something that has to cut across um, all stakeholders in the organization. I just want to add something from a smaller organizational perspective, just because I 
I happened to speak last week at, at uh, an event aimed at smaller organizations, and um, they, you know, they have a, a smaller budget. They will sometimes have the misconception that their risk exposure is smaller because, or, or small, too small to really insure because they don't fully understand all, um, perhaps all of the costs associated with a real cyber event. Um, but they're also in a supply chain that will impact larger companies um, and government uh, in some cases. And so helping them through their um, cyber hygiene, uh, with insurance being such a major component of that, uh, is incredibly important. And I was asked an interesting question where one small organization did seek out cyber insurance but relies on third party um, hosting and technology uh, provision, et cetera, to, so that they, they couldn't answer the right, they couldn't correctly answer the questions from the um, insurance agent because they don't have enough control to have been able to pr provide um, com the comfort level that the insurance company was seeking. And so I think that's an interesting problem for smaller organizations that do rely on um, all sorts of consultants or hosting companies or what have you, is how do they, uh, how do, they do enough to in, um, get themselves up to a standard that so they can actually get cyber insurance and then um, not present a risk to in the entire supply chain. If I could just build on some of these points, we've noticed at DHS a, a need really to bring the chief information security officer and chief security officer into the conversation about cybersecurity insurance. Even four years ago, when we were having our first workshops, the CISOs were very suspicious of insurance. They really saw it as a competitor to the limited resources that they had access to to address the cyber risk of the company. And I think that as things have matured, they're starting to understand that really risk mitigation and risk transfer through insurance are two sides of the same coin. And so we saw a real opportunity. Let's bring these, these two communities together so they can figure each other out. Uh, and I think you know, post-Target, post-Sony, you're starting to see cybersecurity professionals increasingly comfortable that A, they're not gonna be fired immediately if there's a breach, and, and B, they actually have a wealth of knowledge and expertise that they really need to bring to that table in a discussion about a purchase of cybersecurity insurance because they know what's going on in their systems, they know what's practical to accomplish with the resources that they have, and they probably can help inform the discussion about where uh, a risk transfer solution is appropriate, what kind of tailored policy really will help meet uh, my company's or organization's needs. And that's a new, that's a new role for them. It, it involves a skill set that they, that they not necessarily have had in the past, but I think it's a healthy development. And we're seeing increasingly the insurance community and the cybersecurity uh, professional community working hand in hand and, and trying to understand what each brings to the table. That, that, that brings me to my next question, which is uh, how do you bring the, the CISOs, the executives and insurance industry representatives together to, 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 to put all the, the, the information they have in one place. There's been a lot of discussion about the data repository for cyber uh, incidents. How will that work? What's, what's going to be in it? What's not going to be in it? How's it different than, say, you know, a, a layman might ask, how's that different than what we've been discussing with, uh, with the latest version of CISA? How do you incentivize companies to share information, giving them privacy, the competitor concerns that we heard from the earlier panel? Uh, is, is the solution just anonymization of the data or you know, we, we had a series of workshops and we, we asked some of those very same questions. And, you know, at the time, I think the CISOs were a little bit suspicious of insurance. And I think the insurers were really wanting to know what they didn't know. And they knew that these CISOs had some knowledge that would be very helpful. So we just, uh, you know, being government, we can convene meetings and we do that a lot. And uh, what we did is we invited uh, a number of insurers and CISOs and chief security officers together I sort of describe it as a seventh grade dance. Um, you know, who's gonna talk to who first and are they actually gonna start moving to the music? And they are. Um, we set up a, a working group known as the Cyber Incident Data and Analysis Working Group, or the CDOG for short, and that is officially the most awesome acronym in use <laughs> in the federal <laughs> interagency. Um, but it was a really a getting to know you exercise and really getting them to start using the same vocabulary to talk about cyber incidents, and we, we had a lot of commentary on the first panel about actuarial uh, data, and there is some, but there's a whole lot more of actuarially relevant data just from the raw incidents that are occurring. 
And you know, the, the, the first themes that we heard, to your point, is, is that we need an anonymized process where we can share different data points about an incident. And then the natural question was, well, what are you going to use this data for? So we, we, we've engaged uh, folks in conversation about the value proposition of a repository. I asked people to suspend their disbelief because a lot of people have reticence about sharing. But what's the value you're going to get out of it? We came up with six major value propositions. And we concluded in September a discussion about the data points that need to be shared, again, in an anonymized and secure way. Uh, we came up with 16 data categories. And they're probably imperfect. But for the first time, they represent sort of the joint needs and requirements of both insurers and CISOs. And we put that out for public comment and discussion as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, who owns and operates this, or who's going to be contributing are open questions. But a first step to answering them is to understand what those needs and requirements are and what the potential benefit from sharing is. And then you can get into those details about how you secure it and, and how do you build analysis from it. So I guess I would say there's, um, depending on the sector, there are two tall poles in the tent on the public-private sharing issue. And I want to commend DHS for moving forward on this, because this is an issue we, many of us have been in this space for 20 years trying to figure out how to improve the public-private sharing. But the first tall, I think, tall pole in the tent is the question of liability. So what the private sector, I think, is concerned about is that they will share and somehow they will become a target. So recently, um, the Department of Justice called in a bunch of the cyber lawyers that they know and said that they had made a, a shift from seeing the people coming and sharing information as potential targets to victims. So that became, that's a huge psychological shift for the prosecutorial world. But from the private sector's perspective, it was, well, we understand the Department of Justice has that perspective, but is that perspective shared by, let's say, the FTC or the FCC? And there it's unclear. So what people have been looking for is non-disclosure agreements with the government. And what Elena has talked about, the idea of giving immunity for sharing is becoming, I think, a critical issue for the private sector to come forward. And how we explore that is going to think how we're going to be able to get what we want, which is the sharing, because as we all know, 90% of these issues the, is controlled by the private sector. That's who, who controls the IT world. And mm -hmm. therefore, how working with the insurance companies about how we understand the liability issue in relation to how you get immunity, how you then get insurance, what's taken place, is what we need to create that web that allows there to be resiliency and the, and the ability for sharing at the same time. That's how we have sort of seen it when working with DHS. You know, building on that, I, I think that this is where a public-private partnership is particularly very helpful. And you, you have ISACs, obviously, who work that way. Um, because the government, what the government can do is really be uh, the gatherer of all interested parties and maybe provide um, some research or information that's not otherwise available because it's uh, nobody has um, enough interest in that one particular issue for it to be worth their the, you know, their um, uh, capital to to invest in. So uh, government can provide some broad is issues, but the private sector often moves much faster. You already have private sector actors that um, uh, aggregate all kinds of data because they have access to all kinds of data, and so. Um, and you want to be able to move um, on information quickly. Uh, you also have the big problem of FOIA, or Freedom of Information Act, in the government. The Senate bill had actually broadened a FOIA exemption for cyber sharing and then had to pare it back because, of, um, uh, because it was seen as a problem by um, uh, some in the privacy community, if I recall correctly. And that means that, again, uh, any of this can become public. And so even if uh, DOJ has a great attitude toward it, you don't know if somebody else won't um, end up with um, a claim based on information that you had shared. One last thing, and this is a problem overall, and I, I, I'm guessing it's a problem for insurance carriers as well, is you've got uh, data breach laws that are different in just about every state, although there are some templates that people tend to share. You've got different, you've got companies that are global, 
or that sit in servers um, uh, outside of the U.S. as well. And so you've got laws that uh, are different in different continents. Just uh, la this month, the European Court of Justice invalidated the safe harbor um, treaty, it's not a treaty, uh, agreement between the U.S. and the EU, which to me throws open, if, it's, if, it, if a fix is not made by January 16, it could also throw open potential insurance impacts because again, there's a, what happens when there's a data breach uh, as a result of a cyber event. So just to summarize, um, the public-private partnership can help quite a bit because it can move faster and it's not foyable but you still have to deal with all of these different jurisdictional requirements because uh, it's, I think it's very difficult for companies to make decisions when they're facing a lot of different um, jurisdictions. There's a lot here to talk about and I, I think probably the most important one to me is just to say that we're all better looking than we were in seventh grade, Tom. I think that's, <laughs> I can say that with confidence. Um, but I think also in terms of information sharing, it's, it's helpful to understand that they're two slightly different tracks. So CISA is talking about threats and what CDOG is working on is, is actual events as well. So they're, they're, they're the same, but they kind of go in, in different avenues. And you know, I got an interesting question on the Hill a few months ago where somebody said, well, why can't the insurance industry just use the information that you already have? Mm -hmm. Um, to build out your actuarial models and your underwriting methodology. Um, and they looked towards um, ISO data, for example. Well, the trouble is, is that every, every uh, commercial enterprise in the United States, irrespective of size, irrespective of industry segment, buys general liability, right? So, and we've also got decades of loss data. So. ISO or a, a company like AIG or Zurich can slice and dice that data a million different ways and come up with models for industry segments and for small companies versus large. We don't have that. We have 15 years of data that it, it started out blended with errors and omissions policies, right? So we just, we don't have that. So some of it is just going to be um, a matter of time. We, we just have to wait for some of this to evolve. Another question that I've gotten more than once and I just had, had last week at an event, somebody said, well, why can't all the insurance companies get together and share your actuarial data? So I would just like to clarify the answer to that question is that would be illegal. So we <laughs> cannot do that. Um, but I get that question a lot. So I thought it would be worth throwing out there. Um, so I don't know, Greg, yeah, if you want to... And just on that point, <clears throat> you know, I think we have good data on data breach and what it would cost, the cost of notification, the cost of credit monitoring, but these next generation, these cutting edge issues, that's where it starts to break down. The other thing I would say is we do have good information in certain situations, but in, on some of the larger breaches, we're seeing a trend where the client is hiding the forensic report behind privilege, and we're only getting sl sli uh, slivers of it not understanding really all the different dynamics. What were the issues that were at play? What were the controls or protocols that broke down? So, I mean, it, it, it's that information I think that's really important that we start capturing so that we can map it against our book and the risk, and then we can deploy those bigger limits or those different rewards. You know, I'll, I'll just go back to how Tom started this, suspending belief, and I will suspend, be suspend, be suspend belief on this, but I do think with information is power, and I think that's why this isn't so, so important. Uh, if we can actually understand where the attacks are coming from, we can provide the, the, the bigger limits or the, the bodily injury or property damage coverage or lower retentions or that additional guidance that all our clients need. Yeah, there was a question earlier about, well, if somebody has a loss, will the premium go, go up? And, and I think it's useful to think that it's, Greg and I are managing whole, whole portfolios. So we're not looking at, in, we are looking at individual risk, but from our perspective, we really think in trends. I mean, that's how underwriters like to think. What's the frequency? What's the severity? What's the frequency of severity? Can we parse that by uh, industry segment? You know, how can we um, just navigate the different causes? So can we price by a, a different trend in a certain uh, attack vector, for example? So these are the sorts of things that we're trying to assemble, I think, with, with Tom's work, for example. Yeah. And just, just on that, just you know, there's been a lot of press about insurance premiums soaring, and that's probably true in certain sectors and certain situations. That's not true across all segments. 
Um, you know, like I said in my opening, we're seeing three claims every single business day. Those clients aren't automatically receiving increases just because they submit a claim to us. This is not how this business actually works. Um, I guess the, my, my one sort of, we aren't, we're in a law school, so the idea of the attorney-client privilege is a very powerful one. So I wouldn't say it's hiding, because we strongly recommend when the incident takes place that a law firm is involved in order to, uh, to create attorney-client privilege. And that's a very classic um, procedure because whenever you're anticipating potential litigation, you always want to have the attorney-client privilege do the report, which we've done all the time. And since this space has this potential litigation, it's very common for the, um, the, the victim to reach out to their outside law firm ask them to come in to help do the assessment and do the hiring of the people doing the cleaning in order for there to make sure that before one goes public with what took place, that it's done in a way that's prudent and appropriate. So I think that's where you see the classic potential tensions of the different segments that I totally understand why the insurance company would like to have what we call translucency or transparency into the event, and at the same time, the the client or the victim wants to be able to make sure that they're not waiving any of their legal rights that they have in the, in the, in the event that there's gonna be potential litigation. Yeah. That's a classic sort of event that we're, we're seeing. I think it's something that we'll, we'll have to work out, and I'm not a claims person, but, sure. but you know, I, I don't, and Greg, you speak for yourself, but <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think you're, I don't think what you're saying is, is that you're looking to um, compromise privilege in the sense that getting the plaintiff's bar access to information. <laughs> but what the costs that you're talking about, Harvey, are things that the client would be looking for our insurance policies to pay for. So for in order for our um, claims adjusters to properly respond, and all claims will be adjusted on their merits, but um, in order for the policy to respond, it's essential that we understand what the costs are. And then from an underwriting standpoint, you know, back to the question of, well, then what happens at renewal if I've had a breach this year? Then from an underwriting standpoint, the underwriter wants to understand what have you done to ameliorate the situation so that the next time around, you can either prevent it or get back up and running sooner. So, Thank mm -hmm. you for putting words in my mouth. And I, uh, Harvey, I apologize. I wasn't trying to use the word hiding. That's just, uh, I should have realized as I walked into this building, <laughs> it was a legal school. Uh, that was not the uh, appropriate no, use. Because <laughs> as you know, what we're seeing is there's corporate suits, there's consumer suits, shareholder suits, and government suits that are all now proliferating in this space. And I think we're working together with the insurance company yep. in order to understand it. And that's what we're defining the concerts of how we can work together. Absolutely. I mean, and when we receive a claim, one of the first things we do recommend is hiring counsel to protect all those rights because we do realize the dynamics and that the liability exposure is changing. It's increasing. There's more regulatory bodies out there looking at, uh, at, at this issue. So that is the first thing we, we do advise. Um, but to Catherine's point, you know, we yeah. view ourselves as a trusted business partner and in order for us to provide a solution on a sustainable basis and to benefit all our clients with giving them knowledge, we want to have a little bit more insight into the actual That was the one thing missing at the high school dance with the lawyers. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> if I could just go back real quickly to Catherine's point about amelioration, that was a, actually a data category that the CDOG did identify as something that both insurers and CISOs wanted to know more about. If you could share information about what steps were taken uh, in the aftermath of a cyber incident, uh, aggregate it and analyze it, what insights does that give you about what steps are working and which ones are not perhaps delivering a return on investment? Um, although we did suspend our disbelief in imagining a truly trusted and secure place to share this information, I will add that we are about to release the next report on you know, what are the practical obstacles to sharing. And, and to answer your original question, you know, there is obviously a lot of concern about liability and uh, reputational harm if people were to find out about the frequency and severity of a particular uh, company's experience with cyber risk. Um, so we asked the group, what's needed? You know, what would encourage you to share? And so unsurprisingly, things like safe harbor legislation were on the tips of everybody's tongues, um, really having encryption in place and creating as secure an environment as possible was another recommendation. I think we came up with eight or nine of them. So I think people are 
we wanted to whet their appetite and get them interested in sharing and see the true value and what we're talking about that we're, what should be shared. But I think there's a, a general recognition that we are going to need to work together to fashion some sort of you know legislation or, or uh, other approaches to really not allow people to get burned for doing the right thing by sharing. So we're, we're running a little tight on time, so I want to shift gears a little bit. But um, wrapping up a lot of what was just discussed, this is a, a, a really complex topic because we can have everything from you know a criminal somewhere who's looking to pilfer credit card information to a nation state attacking critical infrastructure or a private entity. Um, and so this is kind of comp, th this question is multifaceted, but how do you keep policies uh, affordable and how do you handle all the myriad threats that are out there? Uh, is just calling it cybersecurity insurance a misnomer and then how does kind of international norms of behavior factor into that, right? If our country's responsible for preventing cyber attacks emanating from their territory that are going to harm another nation, how does all of this play together? Well, I, I, people have heard me speak before will be bored with hearing me say this, but I, I do take issue with the term cyber insurance um, because there's no such thing. The, the policies as they exist today are network security and privacy liability policies. So cyber as an issue is more of a peril. Um, I still like Richard Clark's acronym <laughs> of CHU, crime, hacktivism, espionage, and war as the different causes of loss. So, Cyber as a peril, as an event that could hit many policies mm -hmm. or many aspects of a company's operations, that's different than the risk transfer mechanism that exists today. So I always think that's really important to say, not the least of which because cyber is not a defined term in these policies and our claims people would get really prickly if we um, tried to, <laughs> to go in that direction. So. That's my piece on that. <laughs> you know, keeping, said my piece. keeping the price, um, I forget how you describe it, you know, not prohibitively expensive. You know, it, it requires a diverse book of business, clients of all different sizes, and clients that realize that insurance is just one part of a risk management approach. You, you, you have to invest in technology, you have to invest in people, you have to invest in the process um, before you really think insurance is going to be an acceptable solution or the only solution. Let me maybe um, address the nation state or the international piece. Um, that's, first of all, with cyber attacks of any sort, uh, attribution is so difficult. And so what often people understand um, uh, is the sophistication of a particular incident. And the more sophisticated, obviously, the more likely that um, it, it is like others that have come from a particular government. Some governments are just known for um, supporting those kinds of incidents. But people often, you know, people think about it uh, in a movie context. Uh, a big cyber attack is gonna, you know, be something glamorous. But again, often uh, governments will be behind a, what is really about getting intellectual property. So it doesn't seem like um, something that one might think of as a government attack. And this is where, this is really where um, our government is in the best position to address with more than simply technological tools. There are all kinds of you know, diplomatic tools and um, other things that government can do that is not appropriate for the private sector to do. I mean, the bills on the Hill are, they, they include uh, defensive measures, but counter offensive measures are absolutely not appropriate. Um, so whether it's that or whether it's the difficulty of uh, different jurisdictions uh, having different standards and that making it hard for certainly a company and I would assume an insurance, you know, certainly a company that needs to uh, insure itself, but then also insurance companies that are trying to measure risks and responses uh, across all the different jurisdictions that a particular uh, entity uh, is in. Uh, again, that makes it very complicated and I think over time we're going to see more and more um, coming to a uh, single standard between your usual commercial jurisdictions, US, Europe, Canada, Australia, some of the Asian countries, and then some others will be slower um, to, to uh, come to, to the same standards. Um, you know, we've seen China, Russia, Brazil uh, try to, Iran, try to go their own way in, on a number of different internet um, uh, standards. And so I, I would be 
uh, surprised that they were actively um, supportive of, of where we might want to go on the cybersecurity standards despite President Xi's visit. So I refer to this as the geek wonk bridge, which is why it's so hard. I just spent the last couple of days with Cyber Command. So for those of you who are looking for reading, there's the Talon manual, and Talon 2 is coming out, and there is no agreed international law shared definition of cyber attack. Uh, so we talked about CNE and CNA, uh, that's computer network exploitation, which is usually falls under Dick's understanding of espionage, and then cyber attack where you're gonna see what we would call a wipe or a swipe or destruction, which you saw for the first time. We've had a few of them, we've had a, a Ramco, was an incident, we had the incident in the Sands Hotel, and now we've had recently in Sony where the attack actually destroyed information, which is quite unusual, because as Eliana points out, it's usually the exploitation of the intellectual property that you're looking for. And if we say attack, as you know, under most general liabilities, that's an exception. So this is a really interesting issue, because if it's state enterprise, does that still allow you to have the coverage if what they're stealing is intellectual property, or somehow if it's a state-sponsored event, is that somehow gonna give you an exemption? So I think over the next X number of years, both at the domestic and international level, we are gonna try to explain what the characterization is of the terms, which is what the law is all about. Because once you understand, we understand the context, we rack and stack it, then the law knows exactly what to do for obligations, responsibilities, and duties. At this point, the very vocabulary is not agreed upon. And we, because we have cyber crime, we have cyber espionage, and quote, we have cyber war, where we have destruction. Another element where you may have seen that was in Estonia, where there was a, the networks were taken down. And that was considered a projection of hostilities, which then generates a whole new level of lex specialis, which is in another special law, which is the law of armed conflict. And cyber cuts across all of this, which is why it's so complex, both in the domestic, domestic and international legal um, arenas. And I think there's a recognition by the legal communities that we really have a lot of hard work to do to generate an agreement at the international and domestic level how to characterize these events. And that's what we're spending a lot of time working on. It'll have a huge impact, I think, uh, how we understand what insurance means and what's liable and what's gonna be covered or not. Very nice. What, uh, so then if, if cyber insurance is seen by some, I mean, a hammer, a lever, whatever you wanna call it to improve best practices, to improve the state mm -hmm. of cybersecurity, especially in the private sector, what are you seeing that needs to be done? What are you seeing cyber insurance starting to drive, and forgive my use of the term, but are you seeing it driving serious improvement in hygiene? Uh, but I can't imagine it's driving nearly enough. I mean, the threat's constantly evolving, constantly growing. What more needs to be done? What's being, what are you seeing done? What more needs to be done? And specific behaviors and technologies would you like to see adopted and used more of? Well, I'm skeptical of um, broad incentives uh, discussion. I, don't, I just don't think that we're there right now, but I, my feeling is that the insurance industry is, is right at the intersection of all of these issues so we're able to raise the profile and i think that's probably where we are right now um and i'd be curious on, on greg's feelings on that um you know i think that the nist framework has been useful to establish a common vernacular um, for CISOs, risk managers insurance underwriters and brokers to have these conversations um, there's there's a popular there's popular analogies that are kind of roaming around Washington to other um, coverages and other lines of business such as automobile and I just I think that those are are probably too rudimentary of a of a comparison um, just to your point John that the the attack vectors are changing and it's it's too complicated of an issue but um, the very process of, of going through the underwriting process to decide whether to buy an insurance policy, that alone can provide um, a lot of information that's useful to a company um, to understand their own cyber hygiene. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the, we, the last panel talked about the underwriting process, and it, it really is a snapshot in time. And for our larger clients, we are having, we are relying on more than just an application, you know, 30 questions. We're driving or we, we want to have client calls or client meetings with them, and we want to hear from them every single year about how they're constantly improving and, and evolving their risk exposure and dealing with new exposures and issues as they come up. Um, I will say, I do think there, it's still early days and there's a lot of awareness out there, but not a lot of education and clients are really in that beginning building blocks, uh, building blocks point of the process right now. There are some clients though that are asking really good questions. If I do this, what would it mean to my insurance for next year? Will that have a positive price, uh, impact on my price? Will you give me more coverage? Will you give me uh, X, Y, Z? So it's starting to happen, but by no means is it, is it industry-wide, is it every single client? Well, it's, it, is, it is new, right? And it's, it's a symbiotic effect in that the more that more businesses start to understand what they need and then come to the insurance industry, there's, there's gonna be a positive effect on, both on pricing and policies and the types of policies that are written. Also, the more this becomes a standard body of insurance, uh, right now it's still like less than 1% of the insurance market if I have my numbers right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, it's growing. Um, but because it's new, um, the, it's not always like comparing apples to apples. People haven't been getting these policies for so many years that they understand how to make certain choices. Uh, so I think it's only going to improve over time, but I, I really do think that regulators are becoming more and more interested in this. You, you have every jurisdiction doing something in, in the US, every state jurisdiction. You've got um, additional bodies even in the states that are starting to take notice. You've got the FTC having come into this more actively than they had before. The SEC has been there for a while. Um, certain sectors like the defense, health, finance have, um, have had more regulatory oversight than others and that is bound to grow. So, and you know, I hate to say it, but lawsuits are bound to grow and that in itself is, is an incentive which will have its own symbiotic effect on uh, the insurance industry. I think there really needs to be more rigorous analysis about what risk controls work and which ones don't. And that really is the crux. And, and the thing is, these things don't remain static in the cyber domain. You know, what a control that's particularly effective for a particular sector one year may not be at all effective for another sector or companies in that sector. And, you know, two years later, the original sector for, for which it was working, it may no longer be uh, as good an investment. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of what we're hearing from the CISO community is, you know, what we know that works is really anecdotal. We'll call up our friends and our, and our peer organizations and they'll give us some insight, but there's really no broad um, objective way to assess what, what's actually making a difference and what isn't. So I think, you know, not only the, the, the CDOG effort, but others getting at the actual incident information and then doing some trending on what's working over time, uh, what really does deliver some return on investment in terms of a, an investment against the risk is something that I think everyone benefits from. And, and it gets challenging in the regulatory realm because regulation can often remain static. So cyber risk is not a static risk and it's something that is constantly changing. It's very dynamic. So I think whatever regulatory scheme may be adopted by a particular agency, you know, federal, state, or, or local, um, they, they need to be open to that. They need to be aware that what might be true in one moment may not be true six months from there. So um, what makes the space so fascinating is, as you know, we have the evolving internet of things. So I, I was at a conference in Stanford in which they described a car as a computer on four wheels. That eventually it's all about the technology that's gonna make the cars. And if we have driverless cars that they're experimenting with, just think of the, what it means for, we used to say unsafe at any speed is what helped draw the original insurance around cars and seatbelts, that we are evolving into this level of the technology of how the insurance companies and how we're going to actually understand the liability liability is going to be quite an interesting challenge. The second issue is we're also using things like the defense industrial base, the DIB, which is, which is usually a, a Fortune 20, and they are, and the, the Department of Secret Service, the DSS, Security Service, they are raising the bar, and that's another huge element that's being involved, that the government's involved with, in order to generate this level of 
uh, hygiene that's shared across the system. And they have become, of course, have become really interested in the supply chain issue, which then generates all the way down to all the subs and smaller businesses in the United States. And then finally, when you said what I'm concerned about is, the other issue is how many people on this audience spend time on the dark net? It's a trick question. OK, we'll talk later about, about that. <laughs> you come see me. I'll be able to have to represent you on the dark for professional purposes. But the zero day problem and the zero day market, that's another issue that's unregulated. And I think people would really like to be able to get control of that and figure out how to get control and access. And how many in this room have been victims of ransomware? Well, that's interesting. Because normally, when you're around the country and I ask that question, there's a significant number of hands that go up. Yeah. And that's a classic, usually, in the chew. That's usually the criminal side of the chew. But getting someone to be able to phone someone, other than having to buy Bitcoin, and then sending the Bitcoin in order for them to control their computer, that's going to be another huge area that I think people are going to be intrigued in, that I'd love to see more sort of attention being done, because it really hurts the individual consumer dramatically when your computer is frozen. I have a million additional questions that I could <laughs> ask this panel. But uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to open up to the audience to see uh, what questions you have. Ian? You know, on the working group, we've had some debate and discussion about who should actually do the analysis. And there's one group of, of folks that say, if you're participating in a future cyber incident data repository, that participation should basically mean access to the data and let me do my own analysis. There's another line of thinking that there's no, there, if something is built someday, there needs to be you know, a dedicated staff that controls and there's quality control and, and we can draw a broader conclusions from that. I don't think that's an a question that we've necessarily answered. Um, we really are looking to the stakeholders that are going to be hopefully contributors or recipients of the analysis to start to flesh that out. I think we're hoping to get into that topic in the next couple of months. Um, and I, I should emphasize that I think 201, the working group has no interest in having the federal government own or operate this repository. <laughs> So in partial answer to your question, I think it would, it, whatever that framework for analysis is, would have to probably exist outside of, of government. What would the model for that be? What kind of ad some sort of? I have my own opinions about what that might look like. Um, th there are a number of new vehicles that are available. The information sharing and analysis organization model that came out from the president earlier this year, I forget the executive order number, but the whole idea of communities of interest self-organizing for mutual uh, analytic benefit. Um, you could use an existing ISAC. Uh, a university or, or other uh, scientific endeavor might be the logical place. We haven't predetermined an outcome as part of our conversation. We really want to see where the conversation points next. But I would, you know, there, are, there have been models that have grown up in Silicon Valley, for instance. Facebook is part of a large entity of sharing data amongst themselves. And there, I think many people in Silicon Valley believe that they have a level of expertise that rivals the government vis-a-vis -vis understanding networks. And then the other groups that we've had, we've always had the CERT. And the CERT also is an extraordinary repository of excellent sort of technical understanding of these issues that has been reasonably effective. And uh, to answer your question, Ian, I think this is also like the, you know, in uh, opera. There are certain sopranos that dominate the market, and there are certain baritones that dominate it. And inside the technical space, there's a certain groups of individuals that have extraordinary technical expertise. And I think um, a gathering of that group that would be able to do the analysis, we used to have it, remember, with the, um, the Jasons. I don't know if you're familiar with the Jason program in which we t it was out of DARPA, in which they would take hard, wicked problems and be given to private sector scientists who would gather usually from the universities for the summer. And um, they would then write a report that would then be put forward back to government. Mm -hmm. So that had a huge legitimacy inside the system of independent scholars, experts, technical individuals who get together and then come and help the government and the private sector think through the problem. So I think we've had some models historically to do it. 
And the question is whether or not we'll exploit those models in this particular space. Well, we're looking at each other. We're, uh, I bet we're reading each other's minds. I mean, you know, it, it's. I think what the industry, what we're, what we're doing is we're looking at what are the possible um, outcomes of a cyber event, and of all the policies that exist in the world, of all the different coverages, what could get hit by one cyber event. And so at Zurich, we're looking at various scenarios around that, and and then trying to figure out what's the right insurance solution. Um, I don't think as an industry we've decided on that, but certainly what we hear from clients quite a bit is on the bodily injury and property damage side, that that's very important. Um, Alyssa had mentioned also the, the business interruption and the depe dependent business interruption. Um, that's, that's certainly another um, arena. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think you know the feedback from clients is it's confusing. They have to do that full property and casualty portfolio analysis to see where the claim will reside, so I think that's a challenge or maybe a shortcoming. You know, on the previous panel, you guys also talked about, I guess, two coverages or two issues, uh, one being first-party intellectual property um, and, and, and the second one being reputation or reputational damage. And, and, and there's some solutions out there for, for each one, um, but the challenge really for us comes back to data and is, is valuing that. What is your intellectual property worth? What is your reputational worth? So. Um, that's something that we're trying to grapple with now and hopefully in the future we'll have some sort of solution for. Another issue that we haven't talked about, I don't think, is, is the issue of accumulation across um, either one customer or one industry segment or multiple policies getting hit by one event. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that insurers and our reinsurance partners are um, really spending a lot of time and analyzing as well. Th that's actually why um, I had included the TRIA idea in, in my paper. It's not the ultimate answer because there could be that kind of accumulation without the potential terrorism tie-in, but um, that is what happens in those situations where the cyber 9-11, to be kind of glamorous about it again, uh, would cause those enormous costs that would be very difficult for the insurance industry to cover. It's not hypothetical. I mean, in the beginning of this year, there was a very, very large breach and it spurned off 100 claim notices to us for different policyholders. So, you know, I think as, um, you know, that, that, that organization that suffered the incident, you know, they indemnified all their different partners whose data they lost, but had that organization not be as big as they are or had the liability landscape look a little bit different, that could have been a much different issue, or it still could be, I guess, a much different issue depending on how it plays out. So accumulation, aggregation, single points of failure, absolutely great points, a concern of ours. Catherine's point in the beginning, we expect continuous improvement and that organizations, when they suffer an incident, no matter what line of business or what it is, you're learning from it and trying to avoid it in the future. Organizations that can't articulate how they, what, what happened and how they're dealing with it going forward basis are going to have probably different terms on the renewal, um, whether that means uh, you know, less limit, more premium. So I think that's the impact. But we, you know, thankfully, I don't think I've seen it to the same extent. Organizations are trying to improve, they are investing. They're not always saying, they're not always saying this investment I'm making today ties directly to the incident I suffered, but we can see them making improvements. Yeah. This is a critical, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Alon. No, I was just gonna say, this is a, a critical um, responsibility for the boards of directors. And this is where um, 
a board designating somebody to really liaison on the security issues or a committee, depending on how large the organization is, uh, is so important because it's going to come back to their bottom line responsibilities. And I, I just thought it would be useful to tie into Greg's comments. Um, a question that somebody asked in the earlier panel was, how do we know that insurance won't just make a company complacent? Well, the policy is just meant to be a risk transfer mechanism to protect your balance sheet, right? So this issue is essential to a company's reputation. I mean, that's what risk managers and C-suites tell us, that that's their biggest concern. So it, it wouldn't behoove them to become complacent, I wouldn't think. Um, and somebody else asked the question earlier about, you know, do we see a mismatch between what companies said that they did versus what actually came out after a breach? Sometimes um, we've seen that. That, that is true. Um, Alyssa did address the question of misrepresent misrepresentation, which is a a more complicated uh, you know, legal concept in a claim adjustment um, arena. But you know, I think Greg makes an excellent point that we're just we're looking for do you understand how the bad thing happened and what have you done to improve your policies and procedures going forward, not necessarily relative to that event, but overall. And and we do see companies uh, making strides in that. So it's it's not to say that if we pay a big claim this year that you're not going to have insurance next year. That's, that's just not how it works. If you're able to address the issues, then we're part of that conversation. So I'd like to take a page from the British Empire where they don't really refer to lessons learned. They like to refer to lessons identified, uh, which increasingly one sees in one's career. Um, and then the, the second issue is this is under the <laughs> for the directors under the law, their duty of care and duty of loyalty. So how the courts over time are going to help shape that duty of care and duty of loyalty is going to be a very big, have a huge impact on what the company's understanding is as to what they have to share and what they have to do. And then the third element of that answer is, that's, that's why we historically, we thought the ISACs were going to do, the information sharing the analysis. So what information is flowing out from the corporate entities as to the shared problems across? So as I said, the Silicon Valley model was they assumed if you're a large entity, um, let's say uh, Facebook or Microsoft, that if someone is attacking, that all of you are going to be attacked. That if it's an adversary, either state or criminal, that they're going to have a trajectory so they want to basically get that information out very quickly to their networks because the assumption is you're not the only one, which historically has been correct. So your point about how you're sharing it and what is the signature. And then the second element, which is harder to share, is is there something unique about your network that made it particularly vulnerable? That's a little bit unclear what the effectiveness of sharing is. And if it's a unique attack, a zero day, you really want that out immediately in order for that to demonstrate to the, the, that particular application or software that this is a deep and generic problem. But as you know, we do believe that because of the legacy issues, there's so much legacy uh, coding out that you think that you've solved the problem, and then it turns out that you buy a new product that has this old legacy in it that's, that's very deep in the, in the lines, and you still have that vulnerability. So that becomes another huge range of issues that's identifying that problem and how do you sort of deal with that and how, how, what's the appropriate way to, to respond is becoming the issue of, quote, lessons learned. I think the lessons identified area is one that the insurance industry is uniquely poised to provide great benefit, especially to midsize and small businesses, because as insurers become more aware of what actions are being taken and are actually having a remediating effect, for the mid-sized and small businesses that very often don't have a CISO um, or don't have the resources, that knowledge and that conversation during the underwriting and renewal process about, hey, have you considered taking these steps, making these investments, it really does, I think, promote that ecosystem that gets into the supply chain yeah. stuff that Elena was talking about, that you, you've got to be able to cross-educate um, in addition to cross-pollinating. And we'll help establish the standards. That's really where I think the insurance industry will be very powerful. 
It's, it's something that some of the large companies are doing for their supply chains. So it's the same kind of idea that it's already happening because, um, and there have been some questions before, uh, you know, should government get in the act and even provide, whether it's tax breaks or other incentives, but for small companies that don't have much of a budget, you know, what, how can they support small companies taking the right steps? And I, I, my last comment is there are the, are the principles that have been put out by the insurance regulatory guidance by the states, and they've laid out now eight principles, and I can see those principles just growing and growing with time, and that will set the standard, I think, over time as to what the base will be. In the back. Well, and I, I, I can't comment on a specific legislative proposal, but under the current structure of the Safety Act, it's very much focused on anti-terrorism technologies and services. And, and the idea being that if you meet a certain certification, that you then have liability protections and, and a, a companion requirement to buy insurance. So there has been a lot of discussion about could there be a Safety Act parallel for cyber. Um, the fear, I think, is that the, because there are so many cyber incidents that if they opened up the current act um, as broadly as some have advocated, you know, the, it'll just be the cybersecurity by default, not, not so much about anti-terrorism. But mm -hmm. I, I, I think that uh, the current process is that they have a, a team of folks that are, are certainly certified and expert in uh, understanding the value of a particular technology or service in terms of uh, addressing or mitigating uh, a, a terrorism event. I'm not as familiar with what their depth of experience and background would be in terms of assessing, you know, cybersecurity technologies for their benefit there. That could be something that if Congress chooses uh, to pursue in legislation that we would then, with adequate resources, pursue. But I, I'm not sure kind of what the lay of the land is there now. So after FireEye was certified, of course, a company presents its um, application, and so the, the government puts together a team to take a look at that. And after FireEye was cer certified for the first time as a cyber technology, or in, an, in, in a counterterrorism context under Safety Act as it reads today, but it's a, it's a cyber technology, um, my understanding is actually a number of cyber companies have applied under the Safety Act as it stands today. So that is already forcing DHS to um, to have to review all sorts of information. And you know, in the government, what you will often have um, is a, a secondment of experts or sharing of experts with other agencies. So it, although sometimes agencies don't play well together, they will, in, in some cases, bring together other expertise. Um, the idea behind a Cyber Safety Act, which is something that Chairman McCall had uh, uh, introduced last Congress, was that you wouldn't have to have the terrorism designation because cybersecurity, you know, one of the difficulties is attribution. It's the major difficulty. So to have to attribute to a terrorist, quote unquote, will would stop, um, could hinder the Safety Act from really being applied to uh, the the tools that have come, you know, that have the offensive tools that have come out since the Safety Act had been passed years ago. Well, it's not all of your liability. It's, it's correct. Right.
Well, the idea is to actually get them to buy that technology, which is what Safety Act was designed to do. So I guess, I don't know, um, whenever we use the term surely, we always say that's an intellectual jump. So there, there are four vulnerabilities that you're dealing with at all times, right? You're dealing with software vulnerability, the actual coding. You're dealing with the hardware vulnerability, because we don't know what's in our machines, right? You're dealing with the carbon units, human beings. And then you're dealing with the ISPs. You're dealing with the way the system that's rolling on, right? So this proposal is, well, if you want to improve your network security, there may be a certain level of products that will be very effective in 2015. So why not get everyone involved to do that sort of indemnification for 2015, but it has to be renewed. These things have to be ongoing and renewed. So you have a mechanism if the companies want to act in a way to get that indemnification for the network, for that product, it's a rational decision to do. It's not going to be a be all and end all, but for any, any penetration that would be tied to that product at the known, at, at, at what is known now technologically, they would get indemnification. If it turned out that they were being negligent in other ways and uh, any other uh, mechanisms that need for network security, they would not be indemnified. But the goal is, I think that we all think is important is, you know, if your password is password, it's not really helpful. If your password is one, two, three, four, five, six, is the product raising the level of the notion of creating some level of security because at this point in time, we all say offense bids defense. I think that's the general consensus in the system. So we're spending a lot of money, both public and private money, to improve the defense. Because once the defense becomes more effective, then you're going to have a certain level of true deterrence. So that's where I think that this idea is moving forward, and that's what it's trying to generate, I would say. I guess, I, and surely, that would be the logic. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, Greg mentioned the $2 billion of gross written premium that is often uh, cited as the approximate size of the market. So the, the capacity in the primary market has actually fluctuated in the last 12 months, but if you estimate that there are about 50 carriers who will provide the coverage, only five or six of us will do so on a primary basis in most cases, and those five or six of us write about 70% of the premium. I would say that, and I'm not a reinsurer, so, but my experience is, is that there's similar, it's, it's a similar um, kind of breakdown in the reinsurance market. We have markets who understand the exposure and are really aligned with our companies um, and are working on it. Um, but just like the primary market, there are those who are questioning and thinking very carefully and sort of hedging. There is still that uncertainty in the, both the primary and the reinsurance market. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think you hit it perfectly. I mean, I, I, just on the capacity deployed, though, just, just one comment. I think most clients um, obtain the capacity they need from the current primary markets. Uh, there are some companies out there, the largest of the large, which this conversation is really built around, that are having challenges getting that. Uh, though I would say, though, many times they probably could get larger amounts of capacity from us. It's an issue of pricing, um, that we're willing to price mm. the, the limit at a higher amount, but they're not willing to obtain mm. it at that amount. So, um, Oh, you know, and it's, it occurs to me about capacity that so the Federal Insurance Office, their 2015 report that came out in September, I think, had a couple of paragraphs that said um, the cyber insurance market is very small, and um, companies need up to a billion dollars in cyber insurance. Mm -hmm. 
And so there was a business insurance article that came out about that, so I said, oh, let me read the report. And that's really all the report said was <laughs> cyber insurance. So back to my original point, there's no such thing. <laughs> so you know, when we get questions about capacity, it's just not that straightforward of a question um, or straightforward of an answer. So. Rob, one final one. I think more and more clients, as they go through the risk assessment process in-house, they're realizing they have more exposure than just losing data. So they're looking to purchase network interruption coverage, which is a first-party coverage to deal with income loss, as well as extra expense with resuming their business to normal business operations. So I think, um, you know, I don't, I don't have a stat handy. I would bet, you know, the, across our book, it's less than 50% that buy that coverage. But in recent times, that, that number's absolutely increasing. You know, as you go, you know, the, the previous session we talked about the energy space. They're not really concerned about data not, uh, notifying their customers. <laughs> They're concerned about availability issues. Um, so when you look into that segment, that's what they want to buy. So I think that's the one area that's really seeing a, a, a lot of growth right now. Wouldn't they like to insure against stock market price decline? Well, so, so this is back to the point of um, accumulation and aggregation. So directors and officers' policies um, can come into play here. So that if you're a publicly traded company and you suffer a significant breach and there's some kind of stock drop or derivative suit, um, my security and privacy policy might respond to the breach, but um, my colleagues' directors and officers' liability policy could also be noticed because of a derivative suit. So th this, it's a good point. It's an interesting um, area that, that we're having to um, put our heads together on as an underwriting community. As a director and officer, I find it quite fascinating. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, you know, I did. I got a call from a risk manager um, earlier this year, and um, there had been some big breaches in the news. And the risk manager said that the CEO had called him and said, um, "Quick, we need a complete summary on what we're doing on the topic of our cyber preparedness to present to the board." And this was a guy who already purchased the coverage. He already had gone through the underwriting process and had really done a lot of thinking about these topics. And even he was challenged to summarize it and to present it to the board in such a fashion that they could um, really process all the information. So that board level of interest is something that has greatly spiked in the last 12 months. Fantastic. With that, thanks to everybody in our audience. Thanks for our panelists. And thanks to uh, New America for uh, co-hosting this event. And to, and to Just Security. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Th